Sal should understand. I hope that uh, like English is uh, the language, uh, working language is in English. I hope so. Robin, yeah. <laughs> uh, we can switch also to Polish. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah. And uh, so thank you for, uh, for coming to, to, to this event. As you might know, we opened yesterday in, uh, the fifth edition of Tulsi the Festival with a wonderful, um, very impressive uh, exhibition uh, of Justyna uh, Menikiewicz, a project uh, she is working on for last year, yeah, more or less last year in Ukraine, which is uh, still in uh, Avanutubani. It's an open air exhibition, so. Those among you who haven't seen it yet, uh, I think you will you will uh, get a very good chance, like real opportunity to see um, beautiful, beautiful, very strong images, uh, telling a lot about what's going on in Ukraine. So this is a fifth edition of this festival. Here you have some um, small things, like the um, uh, invitations for the exhibitions, program of the festival. So today is the Today is the second event of the festival, meeting with um, our beloved uh, friends, uh, Justina Menikiewicz, Polish photographer, and uh, Robin Forestier Walker, who is a journalist, were based in uh, Tbilisi, but working more or less around the region, the big region. And this is, uh, very, um, I think that it's very interesting, and thank you to both of you that you gave us chance to make the second round of the discussion because in, uh, in May we already made a discussion, very interesting one, uh, on Ukraine with uh, Justina, Robin and another friend of ours and uh, also journalist, French journalist Regis Jonté. So um, all of them, they, were, they, work, uh, they worked and continue to work in Ukraine, so going there, going back there. And it was extremely interesting to, to, to hear them um, uh, sharing their experiences, uh, their thoughts, their uh, analysis uh, also of the, of the situation. So it's a like, logical uh, continuation of, uh, of the discussion that we started in, uh, in May. Uh, that was the first round. Uh, while we are still waiting for, uh, for people arriving, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, say also like two words about other events of the festival. So we are having with us uh, uh, our wonderful guest, invited guest of the festival, festival, Adam Mazur, who is a Polish uh, curator, like leading Polish photo curator, author of the very important book, yeah? No, why you're smiling? Yeah, it is very important. Maybe tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm because because um, I exactly I want to uh, to charm uh, the public with the opportunity to listen to you tomorrow, to hear you tomorrow. So Adam Mazur will be presenting tomorrow in the same place at the same time, six o'clock. But I guess we will begin at seven thirty um, <laughs> because of the jam. But uh, Still, tomorrow we have to be more, um, how to say, more uh, precise. Tomorrow. Yeah, precise because uh, after the after Adam's event, we we have a uh, opening of uh, second exhibition of the program, which is uh, a Georgian journal, Robert Capel Georgia. So wonderful exhibition that will be uh, yeah for you. It's a newspaper. <laughs> Uh, so it will be held in TBC Bank Gallery on Marjani Shrink Street. You know, I guess all of you know the place. So here are the invitations. And so at 6 o'clock, we will hear Adam Mazur uh, having a lecture about a slideshow about the new phenomenon in uh, Polish photography since 2000. Because they say that there is a real phenomenon that uh, defined itself in uh, contemporary Polish photography. Then we have this absolutely wonderful exhibition program, which is it's a great chance to, to, to see it. And of course, it's dedicated to the sixth anniversary of death of Robert Kaufer, who died in uh, Indochine uh, 
in 1954. And uh, we have some other events. And some other events on October 4th, we have two exhibitions on Saturday. Uh, both of them will open in uh, Literature Museum. Very different ones. First is by Davide Montalone, which is the established, well-known uh, Italian documentary photographer, photojournalist, working a lot in Caucasus, Russia. There are like big series uh, he has already done. And uh, Spasiba, the his exhibition, uh, which is uh, with, that was shown in Chechnya in 2014, was uh, got a uh, like, big prize of French uh, Foundation, Carmignac. So we have a chance to show this exhibition. And another one is uh, a suitcase with dead negatives, which is the first show of the pioneer of Georgian. So the Georgian conceptual photography, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Georgian conceptual photography. Paul uh, Shabardian, uh, who was working in the very late uh, 80s, uh, and was um, this was also a great opportunity to discover very very beginning on the conceptual photography in Georgia. And of course, afterwards we have uh, the. Night of Photography, which is open air night screenings in all fields, like traditional event already, so you will get a chance to to see the uh, recent works by European and regional photographers, and among them, for example, we have received like really, um, really a week ago two slideshows from Eastern. Uh, and there is one by Ukrainian photographer, Roman, Roman Bates, and another one by Russian young photographer, Maria Kuchenkova. Uh, there will be also a Polish photo agency presented, Sputnik photos. There is very interesting a selection done by uh, National Geography of Georgia. Uh, you can see uh, five uh, wonderful photo projects by Thomas Borja, by uh, Stéphanie Sinclair, Andrea Bruce, and so on, so like very interesting things. A lot of Georgian photographers uh, this year in the program, young ones, I'm happy to see some of them here among the public, so it will be also like a very good chance for them to show and for the public to discover what's, what's going on in the What's going through the lenses of the young Georgian photographers, emerging Georgian photographers. Uh, and uh, on October 5th, 5th uh, we will have the last exhibition of the festival, which is a man uh, with accordion, Rezo Kezeli, uh, free spirit of uh, Soviet Georgian photography, like really wonderful author of Soviet period. And it's like, it's, really, it's not really his first exhibition. It, his work was already shown by a gallery container, but it's, a, it's his first big exhibition, and he was discovered recently. And very interesting author he is because uh, it's very rare to have this kind of like free and let's say non-official photography during the Soviet period, because as all the art, photography also was under the huge pressure of. Uh, uh, Soviet propaganda and was used as all the other arts as um, as a tool of the ideology. So, and very few photographers could create uh, photography that was free of this, let's say, dogmas and uh, cliché. And Reza Kezer is one of them. So, it's a real discovery, very beautiful uh, author. You will see. It's like full of full of freedom. It's like perception of it's a free man's perception of free world, so nothing that deals with Soviet Union. So it's very interesting to discuss. <laughs> and I think now we, so I'm making the promotion of the festival. Oh, and so Gaha Kafiani joins us, one of the um, yeah, one of the one of the warriors of the division of Georgian young Georgian photographers. And um, so the last the question that uh, 
would ask during the last discussion on Ukraine wars uh, uh, yeah, a new yeah a new cold war like it, uh, it Ukraine? Ukraine a new cold war so that was a big question and all the discussion was organized uh, uh, not organized but like over the turning around since a lot of things happened probably just to be yes. Do you think that uh, this is still the main question that you can ask today, like six months after? Or what would be the question of, like, actually, like, big question, actually? I don't know, I just kind of see this... Uh... Ah, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. I don't know, I kind of see it as uh, our meeting today. Since then, uh, I went two, two more times to continue my story. And Robin went also just returned from Donetsk. So I think it's kind of like an update. I think uh, back then in spring, it was still a lot of space to kind of theoretical, um, I think, uh, discussions with the kind of fancy name Cold War and things like this. And it almost seemed irrelevant to even talk about this. The kind of the reality on the ground became so dense, so tense and dense. Yeah. Then uh, I don't think there's any more point. Yeah. There is some kind of you can call it call new call war. You can call it the separatist country. You can call it many things. But I think the discussion kind of moves to different to to details which. Uh, how people on the ground are dealing with this, what are the consequences of this for people, not in the sense of just lost lives, but even like how they're going to live the afterlife or right now with this, yeah? So. analysis um, <laughs> <laughs> and the microphone agrees. I mean I, I think it's an opportunity to talk about how people are on the ground and that is something that Justina and I would both like to talk about today and our experiences uh, of meeting the people we encounter and perhaps try to give a sense of what it feels like to be there in Eastern Ukraine right now, if it's remotely possible to do, um, at least on my behalf, I was, I have not been directly under the shell fire, although it came close to it on a few occasions, but if you, you, you know, to really understand it, you have to know what it's like to have your house hit by a, a rocket or a water, um, so perhaps we can't do it justice, because there's an awful lot of trauma that is being experienced there. But I, I think it would be helpful to, to try to give a sense of, of, of that, to talk about what's happening to real people in their lives and how it's been, how, how that has been, uh, how their lives have been ruined, really, by this war, this conflict. Yeah, and I was like, uh, so, just like, I will, we will be quicker today with our presentation. I want to devote more time to discussion. So. Gonna roughly 10 15 minutes each of us are gonna show. I'm gonna show you some photographs and like make three main points I would like to make and a couple of short videos, but kind of really roughly edited because I'm doing lots of videos. So, and then we can just talk about it. Also, my exhibition is now going on, so you know, I'm not gonna show many photographs, I just have like 20 to illustrate certain issues I want to talk about. So, maybe I just start and yeah, maybe I switch up the other. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, as only as oh, so as all you know, as probably know, I just like briefly remind that my project is it's not a news project, and this is not the project I'm working on about the war in Donbas. The war in Donbas is just a part of this. Otherwise, it is the project about Ukraine, where River Dnipro. Um, 
appears and returns in this work a lot as a line of reference, a certain symbol of east-west division, which is not very black and white one-to-one, -one, but roughly I take it as a kind of blueprint on which I'll um, kind of searching for answers, talking to people about how the split uh, is present in the, in the society. So there's like three points I wanted to bring as like first of all, as war develops into next stage, next stage, there's more brutality, more people are dying. I think it's very important to remember and not to forget how it all started. Because without that context, how it all started, uh, we cannot talk about the present what's going on in Ukraine. Because this for example the place place in Nikolai. This summer I took a trip. I didn't go to for two weeks, I didn't go to a place where there's a war. I just took a trip from here down along the river of Dnipro. So I went to places for example like Zaporozhye and Nikolai, those are places which are on the edge where also there was separatists also trying to stage similar kind of uprising as they did in Donetsk or Slavyansk, but it was unsuccessful. And for example, this is the place in Mikolaev, which is uh, kind of, there's a lot of pro-Russian people, a lot of Russian-speaking people, because they're southeast <coughs> all the way to Odessa, has a big group of ethnic Russians, and they were like this, ethnic Russians having a tent and protesting and doing anti-Maidan anti protests since November when the Maidan was going on in Kiev. So for example, here in Mikolaev, this people were, this is very much the very spot where they were having their tents from December when they were protesting. Around April, uh, local people get together and they just chase them away from there, essentially. And this was the end of this, with the help of like uh, local business people put the money to create the kind of self-defense unit which built the checkpoint around the city to stop the you know, people from bringing guns to the city. So very quickly they cut it. The, the thing was not, and nobody died. Of course Odessa was a terrible accident and Odessa I think it's not the, uh, it's a other example of like when things went very wrong. But in many places, or like Zaporozhye, the, Zaporozhye, the uh, mayor of the city said that there will be $10,000 reward for anybody who will turn like somebody plotting like the uh, uprising, pro-Russian or pro-rebel uprising. So they were dealing with this very quick. And while in Slovyansk it also started like this, in every city it started like this, with few tents in front of one of the administration buildings and it grew into something bigger, and it comes back in the histories of people from Slavyansk, I was in Slavyansk in September, and they're talking about, you know, first it was the tent, then some girl from Luzhansk, which is now living in Kiev, she said, there the buses were coming from Russia, opening a Russian registration plates, uh, and supporting local people, like, I would say the rebels or pro-separatists, pro-Donetsk pro, pro Republic uh, groups, and then armed people came, and then armed people took the administrative buildings. It happened exactly the same way in Donetsk, and then there were more armed people, and there was a first killing, some checkpoints were attacked during the night, you know, like it happened in Slavyansk on the day after Easter Sunday. So there's like this very clear steps that like certain elements were added. It all did, for me, it does, didn't look like an accident. It looked like certain grounds where the new elements were added, added to the to build up the the tension. So as you know, the people who created uh, Donetsk and Luzhansk uh, mm, republics here is one of them, Polisha, which is that. Uh, all these people are gone now from the pictures. Like literally, all those people are gone. You know, including the infamous Girkin, which was running the Slavyansk uh, uh, kind of rebel forces. Um, for example, this is the conference in Donetsk. This guy Pulishin, he was the I guess he was the prime minister. I forgot what was his role in creating the Donetsk uh, Republic. He was the guy which was you know involved in I think was running the uh, funeral house before he was involved in the pyramids where you know you just gonna take all these people had this, this great article I read in a key and I mean, the Ukrainian uh, magazine talking about all these people background. It was all uh, people from the shadow mm -hmm. with strange uh, history. This is when Slavians was under the control of the 
uh, separatist. And now I will get to Slovensk. I met a few people and then just talking about like how it happened, what's going on there now, because now Slavia is back under Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian control. But there is a and then we'll be going to the second issue I want to talk about. There's a question of responsibility. So okay, now the Ukrainian army took back Slovyansk and uh, there was a law and on amnesty, also on amnesty, how to bring to responsibility bring to responsibility people who are taking the guns. Where will be the line of responsibility? Because as I learned from there was a one man which was IDP from Slovyansk, I learned from him, he talked to me, he didn't want to show his face. So this is the woman which is there, she's running a local newspaper and then she, this is her, she's an amateur painter, this is the paintings of Slavyansk, because of Slavyansk, the different Slavyansk, you know, than we know from the news. And she was the one to say that this, what, what's happening there is like in a Gulliver uh, troubles where war between the Lilliputs started over from which side to break the egg, you know, she said, one guy said we we'll break it from this side, the other side, we we'll break the egg from the other side, she said it's exactly the same with us, you know, how it started here, so it was artificially created. So this is the man from Slavians, which didn't want to be uh, photographed, he said, because a lot of people know me there and they don't misunderstand me, you know, the thing is now what is interesting in all these places like Mariupol or Slavyansk, where people are still not sure who eventually will control it, Ukrainian, Ukrainians or maybe the rebels. Both pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainians are just afraid to say openly, I'm for Russia, I'm for Ukraine. Because just people know from before, then consequences could be very bad. You know, people were killed as they were recognized for being let's say, pro-Ukrainians and rebels to Slavyansk. So a lot of people are afraid. This man just didn't want to show his face. And it's a kind of, kind of sense that these people were supporting the rebels, but it doesn't mean these people were supporting the war which is going there. And I think it's also very important to... to this guy was saying that when you live in Slavyansk, when the argument came, every day you cross the checkpoint, the guy at the checkpoint would say like, hey, come on, come on, join us, help us, you know, you're not going to defend your place. And he was saying like, what am I going to defend? But the pressure was huge. And he said a lot of young boys came, uh, joined those guys later. And many of them died, you know, so it's a huge pressure. And I think that all these elements are important to do in this conversation. So there's this responsibility. And uh, yeah, as I said, my project is like when I talk to people, when I meet with people, I often ask them, which language do you speak at home? Ukrainian and Russian. Uh, in the East Ukraine, pretty much everybody said, would they be Ukrainian or Russian? They say they speak Russian at home. Uh, so, and again, this, uh, they know Ukrainian, but like, very often they speak Russian at home, and they say it's like, you know, we grew up like this, it's kind of like we used to this from since Soviet time, and just kind of like that. So, I talk to people, you know, language you speak at home, do you consider yourself Ukrainian or Russian? Because as I was talking about the split East West, there's also a lot of I met a lot of Russian ethnic Russians which support pro-Ukrainian positions. And there are also Ukrainian fighting in the rebels between the rebels. So the split is not very black and white. So uh, again, I think the question now it's not very it's not Okay, I, I, for me, not, not, it's not the point now to find from people are you pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian because you cannot consent. For example, I met this man on the beach and I think this man was probably a little bit pro-Russian but he didn't took part in fighting. He was just living in his house and traveling to work from Ukraine control to rebel control territory on a bicycle because he didn't want to lose his work. And he went under the bombardment four times and uh, on his bicycle. And so when I meet him on the beach, he was making this mermaid, and then he told me how he turned gray after what he experienced. And he really felt like he, at first I thought he's like mentally ill, or, but he was just in shock, still in shock. And I got to his. So the question is like, it doesn't really matter if people are pro Ukrainian or pro Russian anymore. Uh, the war kind of takes its toll equally on uh, two sides. You know, many people stayed, many people stayed in the Donetsk, I think, Slavia during this time. 
challenges to survive. They have no money to go anywhere or like no place to go. Very often, was okay. So this is another woman. That's the building which was destroyed during the fighting for Slavians. And this building was destroyed actually by Ukrainian army. You know. So I met first, it was like for one hour, I tried to convince, you know, like those like guys that are in front of that. And they just, you know, and then they said like, oh, you're going to be lying, you know, they, they all, they all tell you, oh, you're going to not say the truth, you know, and things like that. So you have to really convince people to, to, to tell you, mm. to tell you this type of photograph. This woman just like, you know, again, I don't think it matters, she was pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian, she was not the fighter. She lost her daughter during the, uh, uh, destruction of this building, which was in the midst of the huge fights between rebels and Ukrainians. The house was just in the middle, in between. So, again here, the question comes, I think Robin will talk a little bit more about this, about uh, responsibility for your actions. Because there's like a lot of being said about like atrocities done by the rebels, but I think the best interest of Ukraine is also to talk about some misdeeds, which also do happen in the Ukrainian side. Um, but here it's like, of course, I think it's not the Ukrainian television or Russian television that should be a source of judgment or like the base for the judgment. There's like organization like Human Rights Watch, which I think are, are amazingly professional and good organization in covering what happened on both sides. And they actually said that there were some cases of one of those volunteer Ukrainian battalions either of mistreatment of people, of rebels, of people caught in the rebel territories. So, yeah, it does happen, and I think it's very important. Proportionally, I think it's, like, of course, much smaller than atrocities done by uh, rebels. But it's very important for, I think, for Ukraine to talk about this openly. And uh, if Ukraine is going to become a like, European country where people do it well with, you know, transparent media and, like, uh, things like that. So, um, so this is essentially the three things I wanted to tell you. And uh, another responsibility. Yeah. So, you know, I will not repeat the stories because, you know, when you see my exhibition, the stories are there. So uh, essentially it's like, you know, the three points to remember how it all started, you know. And then uh, I would like to talk about how, how we, you know, you probably in Georgia have a family, uh, experience from your family. Is how do you deal with uh, within the family if one brother is fighting for one side, the other cousin is fighting for the other side? How do you put it all together afterwards? So I don't know. That would be roughly what I said, what I wanted to say. Yeah, this is from Mario for the few days before the uh, ceasefire. The, so, I guess that's the yeah, I'll say I'll pass the word now to Robin and maybe we can have a discussion. Huh? Oh, yeah. That's good. What are those? Huh? What are those? This is like the kind of, they're made of cement. They usually put them on a seaside to, to break the waves. No, no, no. You know, this is. Yeah. They, they were concrete barriers to uh, slow any pro Russian advance or Russian advance. Yeah, but you do some very symbolic things, you know, because you have those thing in the uh, middle of the road, but there's like open fields on both sides, so it's really not the problem for tank or any car to pass it. So a lot of like this kind of symbolism going on, too. more like a statement than real. No, they wanted to show you those, like, you know, because I'm also shooting videos. I wanted to show like one minute short videos, which are like not well edited, so very very rough edit. But just to show you, I was telling to Robin, uh, back in April, and I was in Donetsk, I caught the very end of pro-Ukrainian uh, rally. And we were talking that a good way to judge how much we support the idea has among the population is to be on the bridge as people are leaving with the Ukrainian flags and hear how many cars are beeping. Uh, so I'm just playing for this, not even one minute. So this was in Donetsk in April. Pro-Ukrainian demonstration uh, finished, and people were leaving like a couple people on the bridge still with flags. So. See, there's a one person there. Yeah, 
So it was kind of like for me to prove, as I have, as I have understanding of many people who joined the rebels because of their own personal reason. I think they don't mean to. They didn't even think that it might bring to the war. Then I wanted to show this clip as that I'm just not buying the story that whole Donetsk supports separatists. You know. Uh, here I wanted to show you. Just from City Hearts, which I also did in April, now it's right on the edge of Donetsk, now it's like in the middle of the war. But back then, the uh, group of Ukrainians took, uh, did the red demonstration to show the uh, support for United Ukraine. Across the street were the pro Russian uh, people with their demonstration. And it seems like, you know, then just, just how it looked on the ground. Шина Днепра в этом районе. 
you're driving east from Dnipropetrovsk, which is where we were able to look for, to fly into. And even there, it's a six-hour drive it took us to get to, to Donetsk. The roads were very much empty, and when we then finally reached the last few checkpoints on the Ukrainian-held areas, suddenly we were into this bizarre landscape which is littered with artillery uh, pieces and rockets and um, various debris on the roads. The roads were damaged. There were uh, unexploded, mar uh, unexploded mortars buried deep into the tarmac which we had to negotiate. And then we reached the last Ukrainian position and we could still hear the shelling. And it was a very, very eerie experience. And the Ukrainians on the front lines there were very, very nervous, very edgy. And this ceasefire at the time was only a few days old. And it didn't look like a ceasefire to me. And then when we finally got to the Donetsk uh, People's Republic side, the first checkpoint, there was a very long queue um, with people waiting to get uh, across this checkpoint, having their papers, their documents, their cars checked. Well, we got through, and suddenly I was in Donetsk proper inside the city, and it's a very changed place, I think, from the Donetsk that Yusnina was showing us in the video. Because I wonder now how many of those people that were in that were, were in those uh, in that video, uh, particularly the drivers in those cars, are, are still there. It was a ghost town. It, it still is largely a ghost town. When I left a few days uh, ago, people had started to return. But now that the, the violence has continued in the north of the city in particular, I wonder whether a lot of people are leaving again. And it, it certainly is in no way a normal functioning regional centre. And that is part of the tragedy because People want to get back, they, they, they get their lives back, at least those who have decided they're going to stay and they're going to throw in their lot with this new regime, this controlling things there. They've decided to stay, but what kind of a city are they now living in? And particularly in the north of the city, where there's been so much fierce fighting around the airport, which is still Ukrainian held, the shelling continues and people are dying on a daily basis. Well, perhaps one day it might be one, two, three, four people. Another day, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, as many as ten civilians. Six today. Six today. Uh, children are not going to school, although they were just about to start going back to school. A lot of students are taking lessons via Skype, which is an interesting modern scenario, of course, that is now possible. Um, in, this, in the evenings, the streets are empty, no one's around, most shops are closed. It's curious where the products, produce is coming in from, the prices have doubled. People are still, some of them getting salaries because the uh, municipal workers are still receiving their pay by, from, from, from the central government. But they can't access their money because it's been paid into banks that are not necessarily open in Donetsk and have had to close. So pensions are not being, being paid and people are really, really struggling. It is, it is, it is a, it's an awful situation to be in. And the law is being interpreted by different people uh, in different ways. It's difficult to know who's in charge. We know that the, 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 the rebel commanders are the ones with the guns and able to command militias. They're trying to create their own police force. We saw newly painted police cars. We were told that a lot of the cars had actually gone before, the, before they took over, and they're still trying to find them. They've lost their police, uh, their police cars. But the guys who were pretending to be traffic police just looked like militia men. And we were, we were at a checkpoint at one point, well, a checkpoint to an area where they were stopping the traffic. And um, people were stopping and allowing their cars to be searched. And then suddenly this, I think it was a Nissan four-wheel drive, was zooming along and at the last second decided that it was going to stop. And uh, maybe it had seen us with our camera 
or in the, the guys who were in it were armed militiamen, but they decided to stop, presumably out of force of habit, because the police were waving the people down. And they skidded for about 20, 30 meters and put their heads out the window with their guns, looked at the guys who were now trying to be the new police. And they obviously realized, well, you know, we're, we're not going to show you our documents, you know, this isn't, this doesn't, uh, the law doesn't apply too often. And off they took, took, took off again and this sped off up the road. And it was a, a clear indication that depending on who you are in the city, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. We, we, we met someone who had an accident with one of these drivers and of course he was having to cover his, uh, the cost of the damage to his car because they were certainly not going to cough up. Lots of cars have been taken over, stolen effectively by the, the rebel forces or um, requisitioned. Uh, and, and the last day that I was there we had, uh, we were staying in a hotel which was then visited by some very influential looking business types, businessmen. And unfortunately, I never got to work out who exactly it was. I took his photo, so I'll try and ID him at some point. But he was accompanied by two heavily armed Rambos who just walked in with him, you know, in their, in their uh, combat gear and their machine guns and sat down in a corner, crossed their legs and ordered coffee and smoked their cigarettes with their bandanas on. And, and that's the flavour of what's going on now. So, you know, the, 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 the pieces are still in flux. The, there is an awful lot of, um, obviously, bargaining and power play going on. Who is going to end up getting all of the pie uh, and the control of the resources? And that is all still to play for. But it's certainly looking very much uh, like um, this idea of an amnesty and some end to this conflict is, is no way in sight. Before, I, I'm going to play a video to you. Uh, I wanted to, to, to get, give you a sense of the violence that is still being wreaked on people randomly around the town and the fear of these rockets and these missiles that, that can just hit residential areas at will. We can talk a little about, about who's firing them and, and who's responsible afterwards. Uh, but I'd like to play you a, a, a report that I made uh, a few weeks back, it's, well, a week, a week or so ago now, but uh, still very much applies as we've been hearing about. People are still dying today, in, not just in Donetsk, but in, in the wider area where there is still conflict going on between the two sides. It happens at 9.30 in the morning. Yuri, who lived on the top floor, was disabled. His body, neighbours said, was still inside. In need of something to do, they were cleaning up. The remains of the rocket that struck this home wedged in the brickwork. This neighbourhood in northern Donetsk has been shelled repeatedly since the weekend. Irina feels powerless to stop it. If you can, stop this war. If you won't, I'll get down on my knees, but only if it will help. The people of Donetsk are returning, but few are receiving salaries or pensions. Some are having to queue for food rations. Ukraine's parliament offered its eastern regions autonomy on Tuesday. Rebels rejected the deal. Victor, a retired miner, had only contempt for Kiev's politicians. They behave like brothers in a bar. They pretend to be God, decide who gets to hell and who goes to hell. That's not their decision to make. 
Back in Kievsky neighborhood, the rebels warned residents to expect another attack. We heard the sound of rebel mortars launched nearby, an invitation for Ukrainian forces to return fire. This whole idea of a peace deal is completely at odds with the reality on the ground here. The shell fire falling in residential areas consistently for days on end now. There's no chance of a resolution between these sides unless they can agree on something concrete. I met Nina Medyushko and her neighbours yeah. sheltering in the cellar. Too afraid, yeah. too afraid to leave. I would go to Russia now if someone could drive me, she said. But who will take me there? And I can hardly walk. So long as the shells keep falling and killing, autonomy seems besides the point. Those caught up in this are praying they were living in some other country. Robert Forrestier Walker, Al Jazeera, Donetsk. So, I, I wonder whether um, everybody understands or has been following it. And forgive me if you know exactly what's going on there in terms of you've been reading the depth of the report daily. But it was it, it was very interesting for me to, to get a sense of why this ceasefire isn't holding and where it's not holding. So what I've uh, got hold of is a map that the ATO, the anti-terrorist operation, and the Ukrainian government is producing on a almost a daily basis. And uh, um, let's see if we can make it a bit bigger. I think that's big enough. Mm -hmm. Is that good? Yeah. 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 To give you a sense of why the ceasefire isn't holding. So I might I might just I'd like to point out to you a couple of places. You can see the uh, the, the, the the explosions, the the, yeah. the, the the attacks here and to the south and around around the uh, around Donetsk, um, and to a certain extent up here as well, Shastia and mm -hmm. Slaviana uh, Um The airport is just to the north of the city, and then you can see this little finger of territory that is Ukrainian held. Yeah. And again, here at Debal it, it kind of juts into, it juts into this uh, DPR held territory. Mm -hmm. and. Essentially, the, the, the ceasefire requires that uh, both sides uh, hold their positions, but it's quite clear that the, the DPR, uh, the, let's call them separatists, because the DPR, L, L, LPR, um, whoever, and there's even another separatist group now that has come to the fore in one of the cities. Um, but anyway, they, they want that airport, and they, it's become almost a, 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 a sort of just a, a symbol that they need to take it. And the Ukrainians are clinging on uh, at the airport, and from that position, they can effectively say you know, we're still in charge uh, of a key strategic, uh, key strategic location. But of course, with all of that bombing, the airport will be destroyed now. The runway will be destroyed. The terminals. I don't know if anybody saw the pictures of what happened at Lugansk, the Lugansk airport. It's it's like. Armageddon. I mean, it's an extraordinary the pictures that uh, that I've seen from there. It's just been completely erased, and it'll take months and millions of dollars to to get that airport up and running. So the Ukrainians are holding on, and again, in that little finger of that strip of territory. And obviously, uh, it's. The, I would say that the Ukrainians need to have a kind of a bargaining um, chip to to maintain because. They know that they can't launch an offensive against the, 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 the separatists because uh, they're well aware of what Russia is capable of doing. Um, and it's, it's quite possible that Russian forces are still on the ground, although I didn't see any units that were clearly identifiable as Russian. They, they know they can't launch an offensive, so what can they do? Well, if they, if they at least hold these positions, maybe they can barter or, 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 or they have some leverage or they can at least negotiate a, a better settlement. Uh, perhaps get the, uh, the, 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 the rebels to withdraw from certain areas or, or cease threatening Mariupol in, in the south, which, which feels very much like it's under siege, I believe, at the moment, um, or, or facing imminent invasion. Um, from, the, from the separatist side, 
they, they want to take these, these territories. And what was also, I thought, fascinating is that they want to create this Nova Rossiya, but uh, as, a, as a viable space, what they've got now is, is nothing close to that. And what they would need to be, to be viable is to actually take Kharkiv, uh, even Dnipropetrovsk, to have, and Mariupol, to have access to things like their own gas supply. A lot of the gas, we were told, is still coming in from mainland Ukraine. Uh, there is a supply line that comes in via Lugansk, and they talk in Donetsk of being able to switch on some old Soviet pipe that could supply them with gas, but at the moment the pipe goes the, the other way. So one of the reasons why Mariupol is so important, um, apparently, is that if they took Mariupol, they could reverse the, 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 the supply of gas, because Mariupol uh, supplies uh, even into Russia, and there's a pipeline going into Russia. They take, take Mariupol, they can they can get the gas to go the other way. It's complicated, but these, these are one of the reasons why they they need actually to make further gains, and why this this whole ceasefire at the moment looks uh, so uh, precarious. Um, and we're not here to talk about the Cold War scenario, but it certainly to me seems as if the frozen conflict is looking the most likely because I do not see signs of the rebels wanting to, to, to negotiate with the Ukrainians because they just have flung this idea of a, of a, a special autonomous status back, at, back in their face. But who knows? You know, we don't know really who's really calling the shots. And if it is Moscow that is, and if it's Vladimir Putin that can control things, then it all very much depends on them and on him and not on, on the rebel forces. So uh, I don't want to do any more analysis, um, but I wanted to finish by raising a question. Who, who do we identify with in this war? Where do our sympathies lie? And I. I suspect that most of us, and myself included, off the record, feel very much that this is an artificial war, as Eustina was talking about, that it's, it's fake, and yet somehow now it's taken on very real proportions, and, and that is the tragedy, that is the catastrophe here. But um, if we support the Ukrainians, which Ukrainians do we support? Um, do we support the ones who have stayed in Donetsk, who still have Ukrainian citizenship and who perhaps voted to plump for independence when the referendum uh, was presented to them? A lot of them did. Maybe a lot of them didn't. But uh, we saw the, the surveys that suggested that even in eastern, most of eastern Ukraine, people wanted to stay in Ukraine. But still, these are real people and they have real views and opinions and reasons for wanting to do what they what they do and their sons and their daughters are split down the middle with one family that we met the son was working for the rebels was a was a chef um, the daughter was married and living in, in Kiev and they're absolutely torn down the middle um, they, they deserve our sympathy too and I, I, they many of them when I was there when I was with those women who were who were cowering in the basement were furious with the Ukrainian forces for, uh, for firing at them, or for, for hitting their, the, the areas, which to me seems um, you know, difficult to understand given that a lot of the rebel uh, fighting is, is, is around this airport is actually coming from these positions. They're, they're actually launching their attacks from within residential areas, so they're inviting the Ukrainian forces to, to return fire, and it's maybe part of that, that's their strategy as well, to win hearts and minds, because they are gaining the support of the local people who feel that they are protecting them, that they're not necessarily seen as human shields, but actually that these are their protectors. And uh, it's a very difficult thing to, for me to understand that we can't just assume that they need to, to look at the long, long, the bigger picture and understand that, of course, the Ukrainian um, forces, you know, need have to have to take back this area if they're going to maintain Ukraine's sovereignty. They don't see it this way at all. Uh, the last video I was I was going to play you uh, uh, an experience of a, of a of a Ukrainian man. Who's, uh, who's there. But I'm actually going to play something different because I thought this might be a little bit more 
uh, controversial and, and, and spark some, some lively discussion afterwards. What about the Russian volunteers, uh, the idealists who came uh, and decided to fight for the separatists? Um, do they deserve our sympathy at all? <laughs> I mean, do they even exist? I imagine some people probably think, are they really volunteers? Are they, um, are they not mercenaries in the pay of, in the, pay of, uh, uh, of the, the, the pro-Russian movement? Uh, these were two guys that we met. We did a story about the prison, the prison exchange that's been really quite fundamental in maintaining the ceasefire. A lot of prisoners have been exchanged on both sides. And we met these two in the administrative building in, 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 the, in, the, in the town hall in, in uh, Donetsk, and they were on their way home. Um, I'll leave it to you to decide whether they were making up their story or whether they obviously were embellishing it or whether they were or whether they were telling the truth. But they didn't strike me as the kinds of mercenaries that we we would have imagined would be fighting them. Of course, there are different people from all walks of life involved in this conflict. Kamil and Degis are free men at last. Russian citizens. They say they volunteered to fight for the separatists in eastern Ukraine. They got caught. Denghi says he was held by a right-wing Ukrainian militia and severely tortured. I had a Russian passport, but without the immigration. After that, I put a plastic bag on my head and brought me into the forest. They started choking me and shot close to my ear. I'm definitely here now. Dengi says he suffered beatings and fractured ribs. Several times on their base, they hung me with my arms behind my back, my legs not touching the ground at all, and used my body as a punch bag. In no man's land, prisoner exchanges are now helping to bring the sides a step closer to peace. It is the most promising sign yet that the ceasefire between Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian separatists can last. Their negotiating teams have much more work to do. There are still around 2,000 prisoners being held. The prisoner swap is not just an end itself, it's the start of a bigger peace process. Vladimir Vruban says there were instances of torture and killings on both sides. There was revenge torture, there were reprisals, prisoners were shot. But now everybody understands that hostage exchange is more profitable. Camille was lucky compared to Dengis. He says he was treated adequately by the regular Ukrainian army. Would you ever consider coming back and fighting again for the war for the nation? Or do you think that it was the right thing to do? It was the right thing to do. For example, to see the truth. The truth is that there is no truth here. One nation is being divided and the uh, fighting each other, but this is the truth of this war. It's still a fragile peace, but for Camille and Dengis, at least their war is over. Robin Forrest, you walk out. Al Jazeera, Donetsk. Yeah. Okay, so um, now you can all correct me, but he said that he was uh, North Ossetian and he, he lived in Balikavkaz. Now, it looked like a Georgian name to me. Yeah, but could be that his father was maybe Georgian. Because there were like you know a lot of people on the other. They probably took the same Ossetia. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I didn't I took out I thought the strongest uh, allegation that he made was that he was uh, he was held by the Pravi sector um, people and uh, he claimed that while he was being held in a basement uh, there were a lot of people being really, really badly beaten and he, he said he knew of at least two guys who, who died as a result of the beatings that they endured um, with the private sector. Now, I, I wanted to focus on his experience, which was pretty horrendous, and when it's voiced over, you don't get a sense of that, but uh, I, there's no way of standing that up, but he, he claimed at least that two, two guys died while he was there in, in being held. And he, as you can see, he was in a terrible state, and he, he really looked fucked up, <laughs> excuse yeah. that. Um, so, just to, to, to end, I wanted to just say, 
unless we, unless everyone, and unless especially in Ukraine, people are prepared to accept that it's really so complicated now. Uh, there is little hope, I think, of any reconciliation until the site people can actually start to understand where different people are coming from. Um, and that's how, that's at least how I, how I understand. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, if anyone has any questions for us, I'm sure we've seen a lot of Bad sound. Was it? Could you hear all right that report? Yeah. yeah. Scotland was voting uh, in its referendum on whether to remain in the United Kingdom or not. I really couldn't help but see the parallels when I was there, and I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to see if there was anything really going on. You know, I think uh, the, the the people in in Donbass were curious about the Scottish decision, and the, I just think the saddest thing is that they didn't really get an opportunity to 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 make a wise decision or to really think about the consequences. Uh, and some people told me that it was more of a protest vote. So whether or not there was, it was going to be quite as overwhelmingly in favour of independence, nevertheless, probably a majority of people supported independence. I dare say I'm going to venture that. I don't know for, for, for a fact. But we, we saw how there was, we saw how the ballots were probably hugely manipulated. But still, they didn't, they weren't aware of the consequences of, of, the, of their actions and what that, would, what, what that would entail. And if only they'd had a year or ten years to, to think about re what, what a referendum mm -hmm. and what, what splitting from their country actually entailed, which, which Scotland had, had a chance to do. I think it was also like when there was a voting for a referendum, I think there was a kind of like very unclear what people are really voting for, because it could be autonomy could, within Ukraine, I forgot what was the options there. So it was not kind of like the setting up the questions, what they were voting for was very kind of unclear. So I think it's like just kind of people were, like, I agree, people were not aware to remember that voting, this voting was voting against Kiev. But at the same time, it was not voting for Russia to come or the armed guys to protect anybody or anything there. So those are very two different things which should be separated. And I absolutely agree that most of these people going for this pro-Russian rally they, none of them even dream that it might end up with the war. They probably would behave different because people from there, which left us, they say the split was, there was the split between East and West, but it was 
it could be worked out. Somebody didn't didn't dis use this thing, so it's not being worked out. So it's being so it deepens. So and the consequence of this is this war we have, which makes it even deeper and deeper, as you said, because yeah. You know, like how was it in Abkhazia, you know, said a friend goes to fight, you know, there's a group of friends, one guy goes to fight and then he dies. So you suddenly feel like that you have to, in his name, to follow and go and fight too. It's just kind of very strange choices in the time of war. Well, sometimes. So hopefully we will meet next time in spring again and we'll be in the office of a positive development. Yeah. How do you see the develop, possible development? I have no idea from you this already? meeting. I, I think um, that I, I can't see it being anything other than, a, than another transnistria or South Exactly. As well or maybe Abkhazia, perhaps, because they, they're sort of better resourced, better connected to, to Russia. I don't know how serious the Russians would be about financially supporting the Eastern of Ukraine. I doubt it. I think it's a disaster. I mean, it's going to be because it's like the, there was this thing, very strong feeling in Donbass, and then they work for the rest of Ukraine. Everybody will tell you this, like, we were working mm -hmm. here very hard, while the rest of Ukraine is like, just like, they're just mm -hmm. like, you know, like, just benefiting. We're paying for the rest of Ukraine, which, which I guess it was like more of the best than the truth. So, you know. And people there really, most of the people are working in their this There's the Soviet factories, coal mines, still, still, still factories. People are working there for very small money, like average pay is like around uh, three, four hundred dollars for that, for that, for this hard work essentially. And uh, now all these things are closed, you know, and it's not even very open. The coal mines are destroyed. And the coal mines are just simply destroyed. The industry is being destroyed. So I think it's just like, even if they become autonomous in breakaway, it's just a, I think, disaster. I just don't know how this place is gonna, these people are like, you know, they they voted for autonomy because they wanted to have the stability. They were afraid of Kiev, Maidan, the, the chaos it brought, and it would come there and they would lose their work. They stability, this small kind of safety net that they were not living in. But now they lost everything, you know, and it's like, what will be consequence, you know, of this? Winter is coming. The, like I gotta say that even in Georgia, you know, the, in 2008 the Georgians already, you know, that the, the central heating system was destroyed in early 90s. But now it's a huge problem for Ukraine because Ukraine was like like Georgia in the 90s. It was it's all heated with central heating. So you just destroy this like big distributor, the, the place that distributes the hot water, and you have no hot, there's no heating. You know, there's absolutely and winters are cold. So. No, yeah, actually, I wanted to mention that I went, I got taken under armed supervision to one of the power stations in near Donetsk, <clears throat> which was operating at about 15% capacity because they can't get enough coal. And the coal mines are not operating because they can't get enough power. In fact, they were without power, which is why the groundwater came up and flooded the coal mines. And one of the mines, the, the engineer was saying, we need to get pumps in because the pumps are ruined now. Uh, we need pumps to come in, and it's going to take us minimum two months to get the, to get the water out. So God knows how long it's going to take for, for them to be operational, and that's with, with many of the lines across the across the, the region. So for the Russia, it's like I don't know politically. It's like for Russia, it's a huge, huge, huge uh, cost because these people, you know, this place will be in Russia. They will say, like, okay, what about like work? Where are we should come to work? Supposed to work? You know, how are we supposed to? I don't know. It's very complicated. No. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Oh, just your name, I guess. Uh, so I'm not sure. I came. I came in a bit late, so I'm not sure if you also spoke about this uh, uh, thing. Uh, first question would be about the people who, are, who about Donetsk, people living in Donetsk, uh, Donetsk and uh, sort of opposing the rebels. Because I personally have a friend who's from Donetsk and she actually had to flee from the city just because she was posting uh, some negative uh, criticism towards rebels on her Facebook page. So she was threatened, she, she had to leave. I'm, I'm not sure if you had 
than many, um, I don't know, if you spoke with um, people who are also in the same situation as hers, if there are still people who live in Donetsk and they somehow feel threatened, but now that it's more intense, can't leave the city as easily as my friend was lucky to do. And how is the situation in terms of that? Do people actually uh, speak up openly if they oppose the rebels? If, uh, uh, and I'm not talking about the prisoners, of course, who, who actually were held uh, as the uh, you know, Ukrainian spies or whatever it was, but just the regular citizen who actually had, just wants to express their opinion, if, that's, if that is also the case. And the second question would be about, uh, as far as I know, the OSCE is the only international organization that has right, and even now it's a bit tricky even with the OSCE in, in those two regions. Uh, did you uh, cooperate much with the uh, with this uh, with the OSCE monitors? And um, how do you see how how people actually perceive their work? Do they see the hope in the in OIG? Or the fact that the OSC is still present, even though, I, as far as I know, because I follow the work of the OSC, as far as I know, it's a bit limited now, but uh, still they're there, right? They're I'm not sure, but I see on the world. Yeah, so I, how do you see people's perception? If, if they see the somehow their big role in that all? And if, you, if that also helped you in terms of your journalistic work to have OSC there as a I'm not sure if that was the way you wanted to lead the discussion, but I just, I don't know, just somehow that was... Please, can I take, take a mic? Um, thanks. You, uh, good questions. Uh, first off, again, it's, it's anecdotal. I would say that given how sparsely populated Donetsk is, it, I, I described it as a, like a, 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 a low-budget movie which doesn't have enough money to pay uh, the, the extras to be around, you know, you, you, you walk the streets and it's just, there are just not enough people. They were coming back around the time that I was leaving. But I wonder whether a lot of people who are really pro-Ukrainian and pro Euromaidan and really believed in the revolution have left because it's gone for them now. They, I mean, if I if I felt that way, I, I can't see why. I would but say. I guess you don't have to be very pro uh, Euromaidan to be uh, against. Yeah, sure. Okay, so 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 that's a, that one extreme. Yeah, I'm not talking about people, that very extreme. Yeah, well, you know, um, it's a little bit like the journalists. We you know when we talk about what the taxi drivers say, you know, because those are the people that you can get to talk to. They're the ones that are easiest to talk to, and they're the ones who feel perhaps freer to, to communicate. Well, the yeah. staff in the hotel, bless them, they were young, they were the ones who had stayed, had suddenly found themselves promoted uh, from being, or, you know, from being um, bell boys to, to managing the bar. And I spoke to a couple of them, maybe one young guy, he said he's. He, he supported the, the, the referendum, but I, uh, I, I know how much pain that they were in now in terms of just hating the situation. And you know, you don't have to have a brain to look at the guys who are in charge and think, you're not a politician, you're a thug. You know, you, 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 you don't even, you know, <laughs> you don't even shave in the mornings. And you know, I mean. Okay, so who said politicians have to shed it? But I mean, it's just the attitude <laughs> is that they don't that give a damn. They're not, it's like, oh yeah, we're the, we're the politicians now, you know, you, you do it our way. And it's just so tragic tragic to see that. But, and I think people feel absolutely like they can't speak their minds about these people who've basically taken over their, uh, you know, just basically hijacked their city. I, I imagine that there's a lot of uh, people, a silent majority, maybe, maybe minorities, you really feel that this is not what they want to But you know that old man um, who was standing in line uh, in that report uh, queuing? I mean, he was so, he was a minor, ex-minor, he was educated, he had a very, he was torn by what was going on. And I suspect that if you asked him what he meant for these rebels, he would have had a, had a very low opinion of them. And yet, he had a very, very dim opinion of, of the Ukrainian uh, government now in Kiev and the people who had prosecuted this war. Because he said that they, were, they failed. They failed over Crimea. Failed, he said. Uh, you know, 
the war fail. I mean, those were his words. I, I obviously wanted him to put that in the video, but he was just—he had nothing but contempt for the way in which the Ukrainian, you know, post-revolution had handled had handled the, themselves and the way they had failed to appeal to the people in the East. Let's say to say, you know, you're, you're with it. I don't, that's I think, I think a big mistake of the Euro and my dad movement is that they just didn't reach out or try to make this. I don't know whether that was impossible to achieve, but. They, 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 they just didn't have to realize that they had lost the propaganda war, you know, way back. And it's quick, yeah. No, I just wanted to add that it's like, like this mental of ADP from Slavyansk, which you can ask from the face. It's like people were upset, him and a few other people were upset. It's like why the government couldn't stop it when it was absolutely doable on the beginning. There was no armed people, mm -hmm. why they couldn't stop it then? They were really upset about this, you know, they needed to go to this point. Well, that's what happens in a when these things happen, they just have unexpected consequences. Which leads me to your second point about the OSC. In, uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan, I was there in 2010 when there was a um, big disorder in Osh in the south. And the OSC uh, were the last people that they wanted on the ground, the, the nationalists, the Kyrgyz nationalists. And so the OSC were really, there were some protests about how the OSC were NATO and blah, blah, blah. I haven't seen any sign of that. In fact, it's interesting to see how they're kind of tolerated. And they're giving press conferences and the rebels were showing them. So for instance, the rebels took them to see the, the mass graves, which we also tried to get to. Um, uh, and then the OSC were, were, were there. And they, and they kept very um, professional distance between themselves and us, the, the journalists, infuriatingly so, because we wanted then to tell us where they'd been, where it was safe to go, what, what, what they had seen, and they just would not be particularly receptive, even though we were tipping them off. So <laughs> we told them about this mass grave, uh, and I don't know whether they, the guys on the ground, the guys in Kiev were telling them, they didn't know this kind of information. So uh, it was interesting to see the OSC moving around, and I would say perhaps it, it did help to have an international presence there that was sort of tolerated.